Hello everyone, welcome back for another lesson. In this lesson, we will be talking about a specific special force called the effective force. So let's take a look at what the term effective force means. So first of all, we must define what a force is. So a force is an action that changes the motion of an object or its shape by pushing or pulling on it. So I could push an object, like push a chair or pull a chair, or I can take some Play-Doh, for example, and reshape it, but I'm pushing on it with my thumbs to give it a different shape. So all of these actions involve a force. Obviously, it has to involve two bodies. So the one that's uh, applying the force and the one that's kind of receiving the force. So you have, as an example, a lady here who is pulling a suitcase. So she's applying the force on the suitcase. The suitcase is quote unquote receiving the force. So the force is applied on the suitcase and it changes its motion. It's always given in, a, sorry, it's always in a given direction. And we use an arrow also called vector to represent in which direction the action is happening. So here you have a red arrow showing that the person is really pulling diagonally. That doesn't mean that the suitcase is going to be lifted and move in that direction because there's gravity involved and, and we'll talk about those details in a moment. But the actual action, the pulling is done diagonally and the movement sometimes will be in a different direction. So, but we show the action itself, the force being applied with a vector, so with an arrow like this one. A force can accelerate or decelerate an object. In other words, it can make it go faster or it can make it go slower or also change its direction, its trajectory. So if you have an object that is moving in a certain direction and there's another object that comes and collides with it, well, the first object will not be moving in the same direction anymore because of the force that was applied on it by the second object that collided with it. Okay, so those are all things that uh, are, are involved in the concept of a force. Now, the arrow, as we said before, shows the direction of the application. The length of the arrow very often will also represent how strong the force is. And sometimes you'll see a dotted line, which is the line of action. So as I was saying before, it's not because you apply a force in a certain direction that the object will necessarily move in the same direction. If we look at the suitcase, the suitcase is being pulled diagonally. When we pull something, because we're often taller than the object, we don't pull exactly horizontally. So we don't pull along the floor will pull in a comfortable way that I would say, will pull diagonally, but the object is really moving along the floor, so horizontally. So the line of action would be actually here represented by the dotted line. And we can see that there's an angle provided. So the person is really pulling at 35 degrees relative to the movement of the object, which is in this direction. And you also see the force applied. The force applied is 20 newtons over here. Don't forget, any force has as a unit the newton, so capital N. Okay, so the magnitude of the force is represented by the length of the arrow and the point of application is where the actual force is applied. So over here, it would be where the hand is holding the handle. That's where the force is actually applied. So that's the starting point of your arrow, the one that shows the direction of the force. Now, what do we call the effective force? So the effective force is the force that has an actual effect on the movement. So it's the force that is parallel to the movement as opposed to the applied force. So if we look at the boy here pulling on a bag of soccer balls, the boy is applying the force in this direction but the soccer balls are really moving in this direction. So the red arrow represents the effective force, the component that is actually moving the object. The object or the objects in this case are not being lifted diagonally because of gravity, they're really moving along the floor. So this is called the effective force. It's the actual part of the applied force that is actually making or applying or causing a movement, I should say. So this is called the effective force. This is going to be the important component of uh, this whole concept. Uh, 
So when we apply a force, we can break it into two vectors, two arrows, as you see here. So when you're pulling diagonally, you're really pulling in this direction, right? So you're dragging the balls along the floor, but also if you were strong enough, you'd be lifting them at the same time. Now gravity is keeping the balls down, but part of your force is trying to lift the object. So it's a combination of two forces that really are involved when you pull in this direction as an example. So every applied force can be broken down into two components, the effective force, and what we would call the lifting force. Okay, so there's a part that is somewhat lifting, not necessarily su successfully because of gravity, and there's also a part that's pulling the object or pushing sometimes depending on the case. So we're going to be using trigonometry in this case to work some problems out. Okay, so this would be, first of all, a sketch of what is going on in the image above. So the boy was pulling at an angle of 40 degrees. He was pulling with a force of 20 newtons. So if we use trigonometry to calculate these sides, so we could do a cosine of uh, 40, we'll get this component over here, and we'll use sine of 40, and we'll get this component over here. Okay, so we can again break this down into various components and you will see that they don't add up. If I add up 15 plus 12, it doesn't give me 20. That's not the way trig works and we know this. So when we have a situation like this one, we're going to be using cosine when something is being dragged along the floor. But there could be situations where it's not going to be exactly like that. I'm going to go over the two cases in a moment. But these are the tricks that you probably learn in math. So sine is opposite over hypotenuse, cosine adjacent over hypotenuse. And if you remember, and it's labeled here, the hypotenuse is this side of the triangle, right? Opposite to the right angle. And tan, which we're not going to be using in these cases, would be opposite over adjacent. We're not really going to be using that. But if you might have used Sokatoa, so which is uh, basically a, a way of remembering these equations, right? So sine of the angle is equal to opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse. And Toa is tangent is equal to opposite over adjacent and we're always referring to the angle okay so adjacent to the angle opposite to the angle and this is the hypotenuse so if I go back to my case number one we have here uh, a little toy that's being pulled in a certain a certain direction so picture there's somebody here standing so this represents the applied force. We're always pulling, as I was explaining, diagonally because very often we're taller than the object and it's also more comfortable to pull diagonally. If you just pause the video, stand up and try to pull on your chair exactly horizontally, so parallel to the floor, you're gonna see how uncomfortable that is because you're taller than your chair. So naturally we tend to uh, pull diagonally. So this is the effect, the, sorry, the applied force. But what we're really interested in is knowing what kind of force is really moving the object. So we're looking for the effective force. So if we work with this side, this angle, to find this side, we have to use cosine. Cosine of the angle is equal to the effective force over the applied force because it's adjacent over hypotenuse, right? Adjacent over hypotenuse. So we're going to be able to find the actual component that pulls on the object. Now, it could happen that you're going to be asked to find, well, what is the strength, what is the force of the component that is attempting to lift the object? If you pull too hard, you're going to lift the object. I'm sure you've once in your lifetime at least picked up uh, a bottle of juice or a two liter of milk and you thought it was full and you put too much force and you lifted it very quickly realizing it's basically empty so if you put too much strength too much force into lifting something well you're going to be able to lift but you're always fighting with the force of gravity and we saw in the previous lesson that the force of gravity essentially is the mass of the object 
times 9.8 on Earth, so times the gravitational uh, pull of the planet. So it's always a battle between the force of gravity and the lifting component, the lifting force based on how much strength, how much force you actually applied on the object. Okay. Now, in a subsequent lesson, I will go over math examples. So if this is not quite clear to you and you want to see actual math examples that involve this concept, uh, take a look at one of the following lessons. Like I said, I'm going to be solving a bunch of math problems going over these topics or um, practicing uh, how do we apply these equations to an actual problem. Okay, so that's for a problem where we have an object moving along the ground on a flat plane. Now we're going to look at another case. What if there's a hill or a slope? It's similar but yet different. So if we have an object on a slope, so let's say we have a box here, it's sliding down. What's making it slide down? Well, it's gravity. Which way is gravity pulling? Gravity is always pulling towards the ground. The ground would be over here. So the box, or gravity, would be pulled towards the ground. But since there's a plane here, it's not as if the box can go through matter to go towards the ground. So the next best thing is to slide down this slope. So the force of gravity is pulling in this direction. The effective force is always parallel to the movement. The box would be sliding down this way, so the effective force is pointing in this direction. Now, this plane or this this um, yeah this plane or this this slope is at 30 degrees. So we know that in math we can have complementary angles. So if this is 30 degrees, this is also 30 degrees. So we have to draw that little triangle to be able to solve for the missing value, which is normally the effective force. So I can calculate the force of gravity if I know the mass of the object, because I know that mass times 9.8 will give me the force of gravity. If I have the force of gravity, which is your hypotenuse, if you look at this triangle, the right angle is over here making this part the hypotenuse. So now I'm working with the hypotenuse and I'm working with the opposite side. So that means I'm working with sine. Sine of the angle is equal to the effective force over the force of gravity. So when you have a slope, that's the equation you're supposed to be using. Sine of the angle, so sine, right? Opposite over hypotenuse. Sine of the angle is equal to opposite over hypotenuse, which is the force of gravity. And again, the force of gravity, you might have to calculate it. It would be mass times 9.8. So if we take a look at a second example, we have a car going down a hill. Again, the force of gravity is always pulling towards the actual crust of the earth or the ground or the floor. So here in this case, it's the crust of the earth. But obviously, the car cannot go through the hill. It's not going to go through the mountain, let's say. So the movement of the car is really down the hill. So we know that the movement, the force that is making the car move, so my yellow arrow over here, is called the effective force. And I also know that if this angle is whatever it is, the angle will be the same over here. So if I can calculate the force of gravity, if I know the mass of the car times 9.8, I will get the force of gravity. So if I have the force of gravity and I have the angle, I can do sine of the angle is equal to effective force over gravity. Okay, and then I'd be able to find the effective force. And that's it for the theory for effective force. So effective force is the force that is parallel to the movement. How do you calculate it? Well, it depends on the case. There are two cases. Either you have an object coming down a slope or you have an object on a flat surface, so parallel to the ground, the crust of the, of the earth, the floor, and whatnot. Again, if this is confusing because it's too theoretical, look for one of the subsequent lessons. I will be going over math examples using these concepts, so this may clarify things. So if you have questions, don't be shy, reach out. Otherwise, I'll see you around for your next lesson, and until then, take care!